Our scripture is taken from 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 26 from the message. Your body has many parts, limbs, organs, cells, but no matter how many parts you can name, you're still one body. A body isn't just a single part blown up into something huge. It's all the different but similar parts arranged and functioning together. If foot said, I'm not elegant like hand, embellished with rings, I guess I don't belong to this body, would that make it so? If ear said, I'm not beautiful like eye, transparent and expressive, I don't deserve a place on the head, would you want to remove it from the body? If the body was all eye, how could it hear? If all ear, how could it smell? I want you to think about how this keeps your significance from getting blown up into self-importance. For no matter how significant you are, it is only because of what you are a part of. An enormous eye or a gigantic hand wouldn't be a body, but a monster. What we have is one body with many parts. <clears throat> no part is important on its own. Can you imagine eye telling hand, get lost, I don't need you, or head telling foot, you're fired, your job has been phased out. When it's a part of your own body you are concerned with, it makes no difference whether the part is visible or clothed, higher or lower. You give it dignity and honor just as it is, without comparisons. The way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together, every part dependent on every other part. The parts we mention and the parts we don't, the parts we see and the parts we don't. If one part hurts, every other part is involved in the hurt and in the healing. If one part flourishes, every other part enters into the exuberance and celebration. Thank you, Deb. So, maybe you're not a fan of St. Paul. It doesn't have to be St. Paul. Doesn't... <laughs> Somebody back there is like, oh yeah, they get it. <laughs> it doesn't even have to be anything else that was anonymously penned in his name. Uh, you really don't have to be into St. Paul and his complex, sometimes contradictory messaging. I edited this famous passage. I used the most contemporary version I could find, and I still edited that passage. But I want to reiterate what Deb just read to you. No matter for, no matter how significant you are, it's only because of what you're a part of. The point is, we are necessary to each other. And you can go elsewhere to find the great truth that we are meant to be together. We are made for relationship. We are hardwired for community. Renee Brown, you may know of her, a very refreshing voice in the social sciences, very popular today. And she's written great truth to us in our anxious times. In one of her many books, Daring Greatly, anybody heard of it? Read it? Yeah. Uh -huh. She writes what I just said. We are hardwired for connection. And then she writes also, the main concern of wholehearted men and women is living a life defined by courage, compassion, and connection. Dr. Keltner is a researcher on the science of positive emotions from the University of California, Berkeley. He argues that we are fundamentally, fundamentally, sorry, genetically encoded to be in community. 
to engage with one another in cooperative and kind ways. Again, we are hardwired. His book is titled Born to be Good. And he writes of the great granddaddy of evolution, Charles Darwin, who wrote, our evolved tendencies towards goodness are performed with the automatic, well-honed speed of our innate reflexes. You jump when someone drops a heavy book right behind you. Your pupils dilate and you respond with a smile to an infant. You reach out in compassion when you see tears on a person's face. The first thing our eyes see at a distance, clearly on another human face, is the smile. We are hardwired for community. Carlo Ravelli is an Italian physicist. And he wrote a tiny little book for all of us non-physicist types, thank God. And it's called Seven Brief Lessons in Physics. When he explains quantum mechanics for us non-physicist types, he writes that the equations of quantum mechanics, and I quote, remain mysterious. <laughs> what? So he says, what does this mean? Does it mean that the essential reality of a system is indescribable? Or, he continues, does it mean, as it seems to me, that we must accept the idea that reality is only interaction. What are we supposed to make of this? As I quote these disparate sources to you today, I see my own communal interaction with others making my life, making me who I am. I'm made from interaction, thank you to my parents, and I am made for interaction. Jane Goodall, I hope you're familiar with her, the famous primatologist, tells us that interactions go beyond human to human, that our interactions of connection bind us to other animals. And anyone with a beloved pet knows this is true, right? This is our shared planet home and our connections of care are evident among many species of creatures. They are not unique to us at all. We aren't alone. We are meant to be together. We are made for relationship. We need each other because we are hardwired for community. Yes, we are better when we are together. In fact, we're at our best when in humility and grace, we recognize that this is indeed truth. Our capacity to forget this, our ability to ignore the evolutionary, theological, thank you, my jam, sociological, geographical, cultural reality, our ability to forget this truth is what is the achingly deep source of our misery and our suffering across our families, our nations, our planet. And you know, whether it's St. Paul or Brene Brown or I can't even say his name right because I'm pretty sure he's Belgian, but Max Planck. He's the man who thought up the theories of quantum mechanics. 
doesn't matter who. We just need to hear from the great minds before us and with us now that the truth is the absolute beauty and necessity of belonging, connection, and communion is our necessity. And these great voices, they offer us hope. We're in the midst of this dratted pandemic, and we're also in the midst of culture wars. We're in a war-mongering world. Thank you, Russia. We have our seas rising and disastrous selfishness endangering all of our lives. And yet, these voices, listen for them because they tell us of hope. They urge us to look for connection. They see the reality and share with us that interaction is among all things, living and non-living. That this pretty blue-green planet that we call home is in us and through us. They want us to live deeply with that knowledge and be determined and brave and different because we can see this. Jane Goodall writes in her book entitled Reason for Hope, my favorite, there's a whole gigantic determined army of those who quietly give their lives in the service of others human or animal. What is so inspiring, she continues, what is so exhilarating, absolutely exciting, is that these wonderful people are all around us. We see them in world leaders and street children, scientists and waiters, artists and truck drivers. So whether it is St. Paul for you or Jane, we can see that we are important because we belong to one another. We're indebted to one another and strangers too for what we have and what we are. We are capable because together, we are better. Not always. I know that. You know that. But if we do the deep work, the inner work of knowing we belong together, then we do better together. Those lines on the maps, they're actually invisible lines. They don't matter. And over those lines and over the stumbling blocks that we erect because of language or dress or religion or custom, we are called to know that we work better together. And we must be better together for the sake of our world for our children, my granddaughter, and yours. We are called to strive to see that we're actually all kin, all family. The family of humankind, the family of planet Earth. You know the children's game, animal, vegetable, or mineral? It's just a game. We're all connected. We belong together. We are called to love all of this beautiful planet and all that is upon it. 
We are called to this by our beloved maker who made us for love and connection. Amen.